So good morning or good afternoon to everyone joining today. Uh, my name is Julia Trehu. I'm a program manager and fellow at the German Marshall Fund's Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative. Um, I want to welcome you all to our panel today on opening the black box auditing algorithms for accountable tech. Uh, we have a great group of experts here for this discussion, and GMF Digital is also going to be putting out a paper soon on this topic, so keep an eye out for that. Um, today's panel will be moderated by Ellen Goodman, who is a professor of law and associate dean at Rutgers Law School and a visiting senior fellow at GMF Digital. So thank you all for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to Ellen to introduce the panelists. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, well, we're really excited about this topic, and um, I want to introduce our panelists, and we'll start with some Q&A, and then we're really going to open it up for the panel um, to ask questions, and also we'll save the last 10 minutes um, for the audience to ask questions, and you'll put that in the Q&A. Um, so we have Anna Lenhart, who's an information scientist and senior tech policy advisor to Representative Lori Trahan in the House of Representatives, and she represents um, the tech corridor outside of Boston. Um, Deb Raji is a computer scientist and Mozilla fellow working on AI accountability mechanisms. And Mona Sloan is a sociologist at NYU working on technology and inequality. Um, so I want everyone to notice the interdisciplinary nature of this panel, and I'm a lawyer. Um, and I think this sort of highlights the interdisciplinary nature of algorithmic audits and how um, when we think about algorithmic audits, we really need to think of them not only in terms of interrogating the tech, the code, the, the um, uh, alg parameters of algorithms and algorithmic systems, but also the socio-technical um, context in which they operate, including um, the humans who are either in the loop or not in the loop. Um, in, in implementing uh, algorithms and AI systems. Um, so let me, let's kick this off, Deb, with um, some general, um, general insights about what are algorithmic audits, and if you can say a little bit about the different kinds of audits, um, which are not always clearly highlighted in, in the policy space. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense um, as a sort of starting point for this discussion, for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that the, the term um, algorithmic audits or the term audit used in the algorithmic sort of accountability context has been kind of purposefully loose um, just because of the range of participants that sort of identify as auditors or, or those kind of um, engaging in oversight. So um, in, a in a recent paper with um, Dan Ho at Stanford Law School, we actually dug a little bit more into the range of audit systems that are sort of existing and how this connects with the way that um, auditing has sort of emerged in the algorithmic space. Uh, I think one big taxonomy that we've kind of anchored to is the reality that there's sort of at least two main kind of categories of audit. There's the internal audits, which are executed by internal stakeholders or stakeholders that have some kind of contractual obligation to the audit target. So these are people, um, you know, maybe a consultant or a contractor that's doing an internal audit on behalf of that organization. Um, and they are very focused, internal audits are very focused on compliance objectives and very much aligned with sort of uh, uh, defining the, the criteria for the audit based off of sort of the organizational and institutional criteria. And that's very different from an external, what we call an external audit, which are uh, tend to be third party institutions and definitely uh, have no contractual relationship with the audit target. And their objectives are sort of externally defined. So their expectations for the system could be based off of, uh, you know, an external standard or, um, uh, you know, a proprietary standard, but definitely not anchored to anything defined by the institution itself. And also not focused on compliance as much as focused on whatever organizational objectives these, these auditors have. Um, and it's often sort of in, in in protection of, of a group that they represent. Um, so that for us was a really helpful uh, dichotomy of sort of internal versus external oversight um, because it defined a lot of the relationship between the audit target and the auditor. And that really helped us uh, with defining all other aspects of the audit and the different sort of methodologies used by the two different groups and the different goals of the two different groups. Um, so that's sort of really the taxonomy that we've anchored to at this point. Um, and yeah, an algorithmic audit in general terms um, would be sort of any kind of inspection or um, external oversight or independent oversight of uh, the deployment of an algorithmic system. Um, and 
at least in my work, I'm very interested in, in uh, algorithmic deployment. So meaning that the, the system is either intended to be deployed or integrated into like an actual, um, you know, uh, uh, ecosystem or it's, uh, it's, it's already out there and it's sort of like this post hoc situation where we're looking at the system after it's already been deployed. Um, and the, the goal of the audit is to kind of assess or evaluate, you know, how the system behaves in deployment versus sort of the expectations of that system held by the auditor. Um, and the the kind of definition that I've been using lately as well has been, it's not just necessarily about the evaluation, but it's also about taking that evaluation result and integrating it into some larger process of accountability. Uh, so making sure that the evaluation is not just uh, an assessment or an inspection and you leave it there, but also trying to integrate that assessment into sort of a broader accountability frame where we're we're actually like changing the system or where there's some kind of consequence as a result of that assessment. Um, and I think that for me is like what shifts it from just, you know, purely sort of QA assessment to an audit where there's, you know, there's consequences as a result of what that evaluation tells us. And so it can actually factor into accountability outcomes for the organizations involved. Yeah, that's that's so important. And I think um, I really appreciate your pointing out that there's sort of an intentional vagueness around algorithmic audit. And I think, you know, one of the reasons is that um, it's almost a desperate, um, you know, sort of Hail Mary that we don't know how to regulate ex ante some of these systems or we don't want to. Um, and so let's just leave it to audits and hope that that sort of achieves substantive goals. And let me turn to Mona about, you know, some of those substantive goals. If you can talk a little bit, and you've done really interesting work, especially on hiring algorithms, how algorithmic audits might fit into some of our substantive um, goals for algorithmic systems. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. And, and thanks, Deb, uh, for that very wonderful setting, the scene. Um, so I think what, what is really important you know, to underline what, what Deb already has said is to think about audits as, as a tool for broader accountability um, agendas and, and processes and thinking about those in terms of not just the whole life cycle of one system or one product, but the, maybe even the, you know, the general genealogy of a whole industry, perhaps even, right? Like, what are we even, what are we even trying to do here? And so the, um, the important bit here, I think, is that we develop an understanding, a shared understanding of audits that are pushing beyond just inspections. And that's something that is really interesting for me as a sociologist, you know, bringing to the table an understanding of what is actually the social kind of um, process that, that underpins an inspection. And that is very often a concern for safety. Um, and, and, the, and the fact that we're measuring something against some sort of standard. Now that's very complicated, and Deb said that, that's very complicated when we're, when we're looking at that in the context of AI systems, or algorithmic systems, because they constantly evolve. And what's really key here is to find a way to bring together the premise on which a system is kind of built or based with how how it technically works and how these the, the the interplay between the two of them actually can disproportionately disadvantage oppress and harm certain populations in other words it is insufficient to just think about the audit in the traditional sense the traditional social process where it's just an inspect, inspection about a set standard but bring it together with the idea so what what idea is the system actually uh, materializing. And so, for example, in the context of hiring, which is work that I'm doing with um, Julia Stojanovic at NYU, um, we can think about certain ideas of how, for example, or what, what serves as a proxy for um, job performance. And is that idea actually, you know, grounded in actual science? Is, or is that an idea that is pseudoscience, essentially? What are we actually putting at scale here? And we can actually meaningfully bring that together by way of looking at these constructs and looking at how these constructs are operationalized and then assess how this actually performs or how they actually perform in the wild. And that is, a, that is actually an external audit that can be done. I'm happy to talk more about that. It gets a little kind of into the weeds and geeky, but I think that's kind of the, the, the way in which I would kind of um, think about audits, AI audits as pushing beyond inspections. 
Thanks, Mona. I want um, Anna to jump in here and, and talk a little bit about how we can think about these purposes of audits and the role of audits in the policy context. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here with uh, people I respect so much on these issues. Um, so first, I think I think algorithmic audits are really important part of a regulatory toolkit for all the reasons I already mentioned. They provide a much needed way to, to give oversight to an industry that's incredibly consequential for human and civil rights. Um, but also is evolving quite fast, faster than we can get new statute, legal statute written. <laughs> so they're a great sort of way to, to kind of tackle this. Bigger picture, the way I've been thinking about algorithmic audits is sort of as a hub and spoke model, where at the center, you've got these core frameworks, right? So you've got the NIST frameworks, you've got the provisions in the Algorithmic Accountability Act, these really strong risk-based frameworks for assessing risks and algorithms and also ways to mitigate them. Um, but then from Wait, there, Anna, Anna, I just want yes. to stop you for a second, just in case some people aren't familiar with the NIST framework um, and the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Can you just give us a few? Yeah. Sentences? So, uh, so the NIST framework actually came out of the 2020 uh, National Defense Authorization Act uh, directed uh, NIST, which, which sits in the Commerce Department. Uh, mm -hmm. to start putting together a framework for, I think specifically the one they've been working on right now has been, you know, discriminatory bias in automated decision systems, but my understanding is they're going to do more like this. Um, and it's great, you know, they're, they're not regulation. They are very much just sort of standards, but even that's a little squishy, um, but they do have a lot of input and stakeholder groups, uh, which I know Deb and Mona have, <laughs> are very aware of. So that's, that's a great thing to have. And then the Algorithm Accountability Act um, is a Senator Wyden, Booker, and Representative Clark's bill um, that offers a very detailed way to do algorithmic audits and directs the FTC to actually do a rulemaking process to spell that out even further. Um, and really just would mandate that all companies covered by the FTC, which is a pretty broad jurisdiction, but does not include government uh, social services, automated decision systems, which I know at Denver I've also done a lot of work on as have I, um, but still is quite broad. Um, and it would mandate that all of those companies have to do these assessments. It doesn't go much further than that, but it is a great sort of starting, you have to do them, they have to be good, they have to meet this standard. And those um, would be, to use Deb's framework, those would be internal audits. Yes, yeah, we're, internal right, audits. exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, the FTC can at any time sort of like check <laughs> and make sure you're doing them, um, but that's really where it, where it stops. Um, and so that's where, that's kind of the center. And then I think policymakers need to think about the spokes, right? So the specific context. And that's really where Congressman Trahan has been doing a fair amount of work. So first we uh, put out an end tech staff draft last summer um, and it looks at, you know, AI is being used in the classroom right now. Uh, it's being used to make critical, what I would consider critical decisions. So predicting if someone's cheating on a high profile exam, um, predicting if someone's gonna have future success in AP classes, um, these are the types of things I want audited. <laughs> I think most of us would, um, and especially if they're being used with taxpayer dollars. Um, but what else do we want to require here? So I would argue, you know, if a company is making a claim that their AI is going to contribute to learning outcomes, I think they should have to be monitoring that too. I would like to see a little bit of disclosures and assessments and how they're doing that. We've been doing oversight of curriculum for a long time. Why wouldn't you do that at EdTech? So that's where I think you take this core and add a little bit of additional disclosure. And then additionally, who needs to see it, right? And getting to the internal external audit. I would argue some kind of task force at the FTC and Department of Ed probably should be able to do maybe either random audits or audits of the largest platforms. I think there's a couple of ways you could structure that, um, but they should be able to take a look. And then additionally, I think some kind of summary a statement of what's in these audits probably needs to be provided to, to educators, especially when you consider the way education policy kind of happens in this country. You've got kind of the federal level and then a lot of it, really the, the decision of what gets used in the classroom is done on the local level. So there needs to be some sort of communication happening there. Um, so that's just like one sort of context to think about moving off of the core. And then the other one the council has done a lot of work on has been social media. So uh, in March, she introduced the Digital Services Oversight and Safety Act, which um, includes a whole provision for risk assessments, risk mitigation, and independent audits. Within that risk mitigation framework, and it is, it is broad, it's broader than algorithms, right? It's thinking about the whole safety processes of these companies and their products and product design. But it does specifically call out the fact that these <laughs> products contain algorithms, right? Algorithms used to flag 
hate speech, election disinfo, child pornography. Um, you've got algorithms obviously deciding personal recommendations. Um, things like what how the news feed is functioning that relies on a lot of personal data so there's also kind of a privacy data rights element there which is interesting and then of course is ad targeting which we know can be discriminatory so you've got a lot of algorithms in there that the bill calls out for them to be audited and then again that's where you'd want to turn to the NIST frameworks to the provisions and algorithm accountability acts so you're not repeating those you're just moving them into this context um, and then it's also worth mentioning that there, that's a place where it's really important to have an independent so. audit, so. right? Because you are talking about content. And that means that the government's probably not going to be the best auditor, or at least shouldn't be the only auditor, mm -hmm. right? That's a place where you really do want a true independent audit. Mm -hmm. And so we do include language there for the large platforms to have that. So it's just really interesting and I think important to think about kind of the hub and the spoke and to really ask the important mm -hmm. questions of like additional disclosures, where do we draw bright lines, right? So where do we say XYZ tech cannot be used in XYZ situation, facial work in the classroom, right? Where do we draw bright lines? Um, and then who do we think about who the auditor needs to be? I just ask one follow-up and then I know Mona has, has a question too. Um, it, sort of when you, as a policymaker, when you're imagining um, audit systems, to what extent are you really drawing on the legacy and the history of sort of financial audits um, and that and the development of independent um, and basically consensual internationally con international consensus on what those audit standards should be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting model. I know Mona's done more work on this, so I'll definitely let her fill in. But I think what I will say is, I think we definitely, what I see when I look at that space is sort of this independent audit space, and independent maybe not the best word because industry associations are part of it, but you know, it's uh, outside of government. And then you've got government kind of setting the rules and there's this constant back and forth, right? So you've got the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, which oversees the CPA, which we, you know, most Americans, even if you're not in that space, you understand that CPA means you've taken a lot of tests, you've taken a lot of classes, you know how to follow the laws, but there's laws, right? That's really important. <laughs> so, so the laws are put in place, you now have this certified auditor that knows how to follow them. But then you've got this back and forth where, you know, come the Enron incidents of the early 2000s, Congress has to respond and they respond with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and they add additional mandates and additional kind of rules around the way audits are done. I think it's really safe for us to assume we're gonna have that back and forth here too. And I think that's okay. <laughs> I think it's what we want, right? Just start doing them. Let's see what happens. Let's course correct as needed. So I, I think that ebb and flow is what I really appreciate about the financial sector and trying to learn as much as we can from that. Yep. Mona? Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the typical, you know, conference, you know, a comment and a question. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanna kind of underscore what, what Anna just said and, and also look back to, to Deb's opening remarks, which is that again, as a sociologist, I'm very interested in understanding what are the existing social and professional practices that we can meaningfully focus on to you know, integrate these compliance and new audit cultures really without them having to be top down because we already know from, you know, social science research that social change is more likely to occur when we kind of expand meaning rather than rapidly change that. So I think that's very important. And I really firmly believe that as we move forward with this audit agenda, we need to more kind of forcefully integrate the professions and kind of professional associations and think about that. And I think that's later on the agenda for for this conversation. But um, I wanna pick up on something that, that Anna also just mentioned, which is the question, how do we actually um, meaningfully um, make information from these audits available as part of this larger agenda of social change that we're after, right? And kind of a question I, I have a little bit for Deb here is can we think about interoperability here? What, what are the kind of languages? What are the kind of socio-technical bits of information that we might want to standardize for audits so that, you know, audits become, you know, we have, we have a kind of whole landscape of audits that are actually accessible, not just to regulators and respective industries, but, but perhaps the public, right? Because that's the ultimate goal is, I think, in parts is to make this a demo, you know, democratic effort. And I think, I think that, um, you know, legibility is, is really important here. And, and we talk about this a lot, right? We all want these audits, the outcomes of these audits to be publicly available. But what does that actually mean? 
So I don't know, Deb, maybe you've, you've, you've thought on this. If not, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot here. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Uh, actually, this is the, the crux of my, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, of my, uh, of my, of my research right now. And, and I think uh, early on as well is sort of this question of, well, um, you know, even if we, I, I think there's like two tasks with an audit. There's, there's one, you want to make sure that you're doing a very valid evaluation, you know, setting up the, uh, you know, the, the, the expectations, articulating the expectations, formalizing those expectations, and then um, being able to sort of examine the deployed system and make that comparison and sort of formalize that gap between what the system is doing and what um, the auditor expected it to do. Um, that's like one really big important task. The second important task is related to the sort of second part of the definition I was, I was mentioning earlier. Of, well, how do you take this evaluation and this assessment and actually have that feed into accountability outcomes. So how does that feed into either like a product change or a product recall, or how does that feed into like a public campaign, or how does that inform standards, or how does that inform a regulatory change? Um, and I think that that second question is uh, super important and has been sort of the focus of a lot of my research for the last year. I think I've learned a lot from looking at other uh, other audit systems. So other industries where audits are quite common. So this is like transportation, um, medicine. Uh, you mentioned finance where um, I, I definitely think there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of what's happened in that industry. And it's really shifted um, the sort of validity of the audits, but also how much the audits factor into accountability um, uh, outcomes. So you mentioned um, SOX audits, which are sort of, uh, you know, post Enron um, there were a bunch of rules that were introduced, and a lot of those rules were actually not necessarily just about, you know, requirements in terms of, you know, how you evaluate, uh, you know, the quality of the financial reporting from these systems, but a lot of those rules were actually around, you know, consequences from these audits. So a lot of those rules were transparency rules. One was, you know, now if you, you're an auditor and you do an audit report of a, like a financial audit report, you have to, you have to submit that to the EDGAR database and the SEC is now monitoring <laughs> what the outcomes of your report are. And, and that EDGAR database isn't publicly available, but it's, it's available, it's available upon request. And there's sort of like a, 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 a mediated transparency regime that they have in finance where um, the audit results are accessible uh, in a way and through a process of vetting process of like, if you're a valid, you know, if you're an actor that's sort of been approved um, uh, under certain criteria, then you can see, you know, how well these systems are doing. For public, publicly traded companies, now they have to make their financial reports public. <laughs> um, and there's all of these rules that were brought in. And what we realized was those rules were not just rules around. And I think this is an interesting contrast in my perspective to the conversation right now in the algorithmic auditing space. So if you look at like, ICOs, um, like the Information Commissioner Office in the UK and their like auditability guidelines, or even if you look at the Algorithmic Accountability Act, there's a lot of focus on what is in the audit. Like, are we gonna audit for bias? Are we gonna, even if you look at New York's hiring, um, uh, you know, the, the, the new sort of uh, bill that came out of uh, New York City, uh, City Council recently, the focus is on, you know, is this a, like, this is the bias audit. How are we gonna, like the details of the audit content itself. And I think that that is very valid and definitely a locus of discussion. Um, but when you look at sort of other industries and, um, uh, you know, where regulation has really shifted accountability outcomes, when I say accountability outcomes, I mean, you know, bad actors get punished, <laughs> good actors get rewarded. Um, uh, a lot of those interventions are actually not know so much about the details of the evaluation, but also around all these other factors that relate to, you know, uh, the consequences of the audit and, and, and mandating, you know, like, you know, a response time, for example, that's another sort of feature that we noticed across different industries is they'll mandate that the company has to respond by a particular time, or there's like other consequences or additional fines. Um, they'll mandate sort of making the, the report, the audit report, like public or visible in some way. Um, they also mandate other things in terms of not just accountability on the like corporate response side, but also um, setting up structures of accountability for like the auditors themselves. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, we have regulations and guidelines and best practice sort of restrictions for auditors in the finance space and in the medical space. 
uh, the medical device space, why don't we have anything like that for algorithmic auditors? Anyone can call themselves an algorithmic auditor right now. Um, and, and that could satisfy like, you know, uh, the Digital Services Act uh, uh, sort of mandate to hire an independent audit. You can just take anyone and, and call them an auditor and satisfy that requirement. So it's part of uh, ensuring accountability to make sure that we have, you know, uh, some kind of validation certification accreditation process for auditors as well. So I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, these details that are now kind of revealing themselves in these other audit systems and, and emerging as like important considerations for us um, uh, in, in the algorithmic accountability context. Yeah, and I, I'm like happy to like list more, <laughs> um, but I don't want to take up too much time as well. We, we definitely, uh, me, and, me and Dan have a paper coming up at AIS where we, uh, we pretty much look at all these other audit systems and we highlight some of the patterns that we notice and we try to connect that to practices that happen in these other uh, communities. I'll say like the sort of top three practices is like one is like there's some kind of oversight board um, in the sense of, uh, you know, there's some kind of uh, like in, in, in finance and in, in transportation, there's 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 some kind of, uh, you know, uh, professional society or professional standards for auditors. And that's something that we have not yet established or set up in this algorithmic accountability space. Another sort of second point that was pretty resonant is the existence of like an incident reporting database where um, we don't really have uh, any way for harms discovery to happen in the algorithmic context. If someone has a complaint about an algorithmic deployment, there's no like a avenue for them to communicate with regulators or even communicate with a broader ecosystem of auditors. Um, uh, so the existence of like an incident reporting database um, uh, and similarly sort of like registering audits in some kind of accessible database uh, similar to Edgar, like that's not something that we do. We don't really have those like transparency regimes. Um, and then the sort of uh, uh, final point that we had made was the, the point I was making around some of these like post audit measures of uh, you know, legislation right now, I think the DSA does this a little bit of like, you know, the companies have to respond within, I think it was 90 days or 180 days or something, but we don't really, we haven't really fleshed out the details of what does it actually mean? What kind of corporate responses are we expecting to these audits? And are there ways in which we can enforce that through uh, like a regulatory mandate of like, you know, the company actually has to pay attention or respond in this particular way to an audit outcome. So that's like sort of the third thing. And I think like to your point, I do think transparency does help a lot with that, um, especially in our space where um, people do pay attention, especially, you know, um, online platform audits in particular, users are like the users are uh, the public, right? So when there's an audit of let's say like Facebook's algorithm and let's say that public, that, that audit was made, the audit results were made public without the interference of Facebook, for example, either to like quell the, quell the, 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 the severity of the, of the, you know, the audit results or, or sort of like censored in some way, let's say you, you actually got full access to the audit results. Even if Facebook did not take direct action in response to that audit report, um, the public does a really good job, uh, the public and also institutions that uh, mobilize the public like the ACLU, they do a really good job coordinating um, sort of these campaigns that end up leading to accountability outcomes regardless. So I, I do think your point around making things public and thinking about post audit actions um, is, is totally in line with the kind of research we're doing and the, the results we have there as well. Um, so yeah, all this to say that there's, there's things happening in other audit spaces that we can definitely learn from to go from just like a really good evaluation to an evaluation that actually holds weight in terms of broader accountability outcomes. Wow, Deb. <laughs> Sorry, that so was a lot of words. There's so much <laughs> there to talk about. Um, I, I think just doing my moderator job, I'm going to list up just a, a couple of things Maybe one thing from what you said, and one thing from what Anna said, and I, then Mona, I want you to you to sort of reflect and respond, um, and then we can take it from there. Okay, so so Deb, um, you know when you talk about um, you, whether or not the audit the uh, audit object has any part, has participated or not, I mean in some ways, unless it's a sort of scraping exercise or a, you know, sock puppet account or GDPR data, um, unless those are the sources of, of uh, or the inputs for the audit, there's going to have to be some cooperation. And I think, um, you know, Anna 
has laid out kind of different audiences that might have different amounts of access, right, to, to um, the underlying data and the systems. And um, which is, you know, sort of something that um, is interesting to pursue. And you can sort of see the beginnings of that in some of the, in the AI Act um, in, in the EU and what the UK is doing. Um, Anna, you also, in your, your hub and spoke, um, template, I think, you know, another way to think about that is, is we can think of it a, a kind of overarching regulation that deals with AI audits, and then we can think of the verticals. Um, and so, and this goes to qualifications that would be needed to conduct the audit. Um, and so, you know, if we think about AI or algorithmic audits writ large, it would actually very difficult to think about what qualifications would be necessary, because they're, you know, the obviously technical qualifications, but then they also might be, and you know, people are starting to say everybody needs to bring on philosophers and arts and science, you know, humanities majors, because you know you have to be able to understand um, first of all surfacing harms discovery, which is a great, you know, it's a great term. Um, you know, who is in the best position to audit that that has been done appropriately? When I think about the Frances Haugen testimony, right when she said algorithmic harms were discovered, they were surfaced, and then the corporate structure and the incentive structure was such that they were batted away. That is an object for audit, right, is to see how that works. And that's a very different kind of qualification than someone who's who's looking at code. And so, um, and then the verticals, if we're talking about healthcare, education, policing, right, so understanding those systems and the human technical interface it might be different in each of those verticals. And so I sort of throw this over to you, Mona, as the big like socio-technical stew when we think about qualifications and also just where responsibility, governance responsibility, either in the company or outside for an external audit um, uh, for policymakers or civil society, how do we think about those things? Yeah, thanks, Alan. That's a big question. Um, and I'm, I just want to kind of offer my thoughts and I'd be very, very curious to hear from Anna and Deb as well. So I think first and foremost, we need to have a base, a shared baseline understanding of what an audit should do. What is the you know, very basic social process that we're actually trying to implement here? Is it, you know, for safety? You know, what, what is the idea behind it? Um, and there's a there's a ton of, you know, not a ton, but there's a, a fair bit of balls in the air with regards to AI audits specifically. So I think it's very important to establish that first, because as you said, Ellen, if we talk about, you know, stakeholder involvement and different kinds of expertise, I think we do need to have a shared understanding what an audit is and and what it is not. Right. It's it's probably not an impact assessment, which I would think is something that happens perhaps pre deployment. Right. And it's maybe more internal. So I do think there's a lot of work that we still need to do with getting on the same page here. Um, then I do think that um, we'll end up in a situation and I don't think that it's a bad thing where where the actual audits, you know, the 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 way in which they are being deployed is vertical specific and not only vertical specific, but professional practice specific. The way in which, you know, a specific, let's say risk assessment system in the emergency room is used by nurses will be very different from the way in which, uh, you know, a computer vision technology uh, system is used to assist radiologists, right? So there, there's, there's different ways in which these systems, A, work, purely on a technical basis, but also are slotted into existing social and professional practices in how their um, meanings are interpreted, right? Um, and, and we need to make very, we need to be very careful not to impose any kind of assumptions around how they're being used, which could water down actual good audits, right? You know, basically buying into the idea that one AI system is used by nurses in this one very prescribed way, which could be very different from the way in which is actually being used. And the notion of professional discretion plays a really important role here. And, and we kind of need to find um, when we actually, you know, once we have a, a sort of baseline definition of what audits should do, then get to a place where we need to think about how do we actually 
enact those in these verticals and with these different professional practices in mind. And I think because AI systems are contextual, AI audits will be too, which is why I kind of asked this question about interoperability of um, outputs or outcomes of AI audits to Deb, right? Because we then need to loop back to the macro level. We kind of need to, to get to a circular kind of process here. And I think that's, that's where the rubber hits the road um, ultimately. I don't know if I can respond quickly. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I I think that that's that's definitely um, uh, you know an approach to 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 making sure that you know there's because I, I think the other thing the other sort of value especially about sort of like third party and external audits is um, the fact that you have more eyes on the system right you have more perspectives looking at the same artifact and that just reveals different harms and different issues, you know, you, you have effectively evaluators asking new questions about the system that really challenge the narratives brought forth by the companies about how well that system is working and what that system is doing. And I think that is inherently the value of audit. So the idea of, you know, sharing information about the audit result with a broader ecosystem of people or engaging a greater kind of like diversity of, of, of participants in the audit sort of practice makes makes a lot of sense as 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 a way to really increase the number of uh you know the the, the perspectives analyzing the artifact and then really uh you know i help to help to identify more issues by looking at it from different angles i think the the challenge like the sort of practical challenge of of you know making the audit the auditing practice more accessible or um you know releasing audit results for outside scrutiny is that not all auditors, and this is really like something that we learned looking at other communities as well, is not all auditors actually necessarily have the sort of best intent. You can have, uh, there have been situations in other industries of, uh, you know, uh, individuals representing, you know, uh, like competitors within the same industry operating or standing in as auditors and then not responsibly handling the information provided to them um, uh, and sort of scrutinizing the system with the purpose of, you know, uh, uh, dealing with a competitor unethically. So I, I, there's there's been cases of that. And I think as a result of that, um, there's kind of like a wariness in, in government of just making it com completely open uh, to the public or making uh, everyone kind of eligible to participate as an auditor. And it seems like the approach that um, has been taken in at least a, a few industries has just been having some kind of oversight over the audit population, the auditor population themselves to say like, not everyone can call themselves an auditor, um, especially if an auditor gets privileged access to a particular product. Uh, there's some kind of vetting process. We have to make sure that you're actually independent of you know, the company and any competitors of that company. We have to actually make sure that you're qualified uh, to ask the questions that uh, you're in a position to ask or that would be like beneficial for accountability for you to ask. Um, so I think that, the, you know, that, that, inter that, that intervention, I'm not sure if it's the ideal one, but it, it's sort of the, the current kind of standard around, um, you know, just having sort of vetted access or having some kind of, I, because I, I think your, your vision is sort of like a, a, a more kind of absolute, I'm, I'm, and I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are too, of like, uh, you know, uh, dampening the vision from some, like from a more absolute, like everyone in the public kind of has access to this and has an ability to, to contribute to this versus a more restricted space of, uh, you know, after some kind of vetting, after some kind of certification, then those that are sort of qualified uh, will have access because they're I think that the, the sort of uh, to play devil's advocate on my own point the sort of down uh, you know downside of of um, having an oversight board and having a vetting process is well how do you determine what these qualifications are are there details of those qualifications that might um, exclude you know the parties that need to participate in this the most um, uh, especially if they're coming from like a marginalized population that might not be it might not be as easy for them to get certification as, as another group. Uh, so I think there is like nuance to that proposal of having some kind of auditor oversight or auditor practice oversight. Um, but yeah, I'm curious what you think about just like restricting the vision of like absolute transparency or absolute interoperability to something that is a little bit more uh, uh, gated or vetted or guarded. Um, well, I know, I, I think Mona has thoughts on that, but I want to, um, I just want to, just want to pivot a little bit um, and move from 
qualifications um, to a question actually that we got in the Q&A that's also a question I have and I think has been raised by all of you, which is we recognize that algorithms, many algorithms at least, are a, a tremendously um, dynamic process, right? And so when Elon Musk said, um, you know, we want, we want, I'm going to get in there and we're going to like open up the code for Twitter, there was sort of, you know, appreciation in the transparency community followed by, well, wait a minute, there isn't like, what does that even mean? What is that, the code, which code, like one second's code or the next second's code or um, so, and and who, who's, who can understand it, right? So who is it useful for? Um, and so, but, but just sticking on this dynamism point, we've got dynamic processes, and then we've got products which are in, deployed and then jiggered and re-optimized and redeployed and humans in the loop who may be overriding the algorithm or, you know, so, um, so the question was, um, Mona mentioned that audits are not just about thinking of the life cycle of one product or one system. How do you think about drawing the boundaries of where an audit begins and ends, especially for identifying unintended or unexpected impacts? And maybe, Anna, you can start because, the, you know, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, like, definitely has a view about this. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk more about DeSosa's view on it, but they're, but they're, they're similar, yeah, right? It's no this worries. idea of like an ongoing, like this, this isn't like a one-time thing, we did our audit, we're good, right? These are ongoing, but ha, have you as a company or product team put in practices so you are ongoingly monitoring the risk, whether it be discrimination, whether it be, you know, accessibility or various other harms, like have you assessed your risks? And then have you put in practices? And as new risks emerge, are you putting in practices? And then are you doing scenario planning, right? So one of uh, the way, you know, the Digital Services Oversight and Safety Act handles this is, you know, you have your risk assessment. And then one of the top mitigation things we need to do and document is scenario planning, right? Think about how your product's gonna be misused or how it could go wrong and document how what you're doing right now <laughs> to prepare for that. Um, in the social media context, obviously that, you know, we're thinking about influence operations, elections, things like that, but you can imagine it in, in every other sector as well. So I do definitely think it's, uh, it's not meant to be a com compliance checkbox tool. It really is meant to be like an active ongoing thing. I think that's true in Algorithm Accountability Act as, as well, to put these processes in place. And I think you see it in companies as well. So you've got like Arthur AI and tools of that nature where they're supposed to be kind of ongoingly monitoring various things and so you can discuss kind of putting those types of processes in place and I know there, there are other tools like that um, so I think that's what we're what we're trying to push for in this legislation now obviously legislation is like legal text the details get kind of worked out further down the line um, I'll just really quickly circle back to um, this discussion of like expertise verticals I think you know we see this with CPAs as well, right? Like a lot of CPAs are experts in like nonprofit <laughs> finances or you know like corporate taxes and corporate disclosures. So I think it's totally reasonable to expect that. Um, and I actually think one area that doesn't get discussed a lot, so I'll say it to this community, is you know the antitrust bills are moving pretty quickly. Uh, and for reference, I used to to work for Congressman Cicilline. Um, Self preferencing is you know basically an algorithm deciding that one set needs to be favored over another. So Amazon's algorithm favoring Amazon Basics products for the buy box. Um, in order to comply with these new self-preferencing laws, I, I think it's reasonable to assume these types of audits, at least internal, and if they're smart, these <laughs> big tech companies are smart, will we'll turn to external audits. So just something to put on your radar too, that like there are so many subfields you can see this. Thanks. Uh, Mona, did you wanna come in on the qualifications point? I think, yeah, just to underscore that I think that expertise is extremely important and it is important that people who, you know, com individuals or communities of practice who represent um, lived experience have, you know, are, have some accountability relationship to the community that they're representing. Um, why am I flagging this? Um, Deb and Anna both talked about harms and I think what we really need to keep in mind is that, um, the basic social problem that we have, or the basic pr 
problem that we have with algorithmic harm is we don't necessarily are able to see it until it occurs. At least that's what we that we that we hear from the tech community, right? And so it, but we know that it's more likely to occur along the existing fault lines of social stratification and the intersections thereof, which means that those who are affected the most. Um, have the least resources to actually flag the harm. So we need a process by which we can anticipate these kinds of harms so that the labor of flagging harm is not on the side of those who are experiencing the harm, but those who are kind of causing it. And that is something that in my book needs to be firmly on the side of impact assessment, algorithmic impact assessment. So pre-deployment, we need to move beyond the social logic of using the public, using markets as a lab for testing, you know, how the algorithm will behave. That's one thing. So that's different from audit, right? Audit happens once it, it, it's a form of product that is in the market, that's being deployed and so on. With regards to when audits happen, I think there's different kinds of decisions that can be made here, right? One is timeline. Is there an update? Um, is there a new feature? Is there a new market that's being tapped into? There's like different kind of timelines that could be um, that could be uh, developed here. Um, with regards to professions, I think you know accreditation might be something interesting to think about here. The other thing that is really important to think about is, and I would say that as a sociologist, you know, what is actually the 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 social assumption and the calculative model that we're dealing with here. We're talking so much about the technology, right? But we can get at harm and we can get at, you know, disproportionate impact if we develop a model whereby we ask people, how do you think you're going to make money of this? Like, what's your business model? What is the basic economic or business idea here? And that's a very straightforward question that can help surface potential harms, right? If your basic idea is they got, that you're gonna use personality as a proxy for job fit, that already points you in a very good direction with regards to what harms could possibly occur. So I think we need to work a little bit more on kind of the, on that side of both algorithmic impacts and, and audits. And, and transparency, some of that is, yeah. Um, all right, let me move to another question, which takes us to Europe. Um, you know, in so much of, of um, AI governance, Europe is out ahead, and the things we see um, being proposed in Congress are really sort of catch up to where, um, to where they are. And so this question is about the DSA. Um, and uh, I think it's mostly, it's somewhat directed at you, Deb. Um, what is your opinion on the DSA? Um, is this sort of, and the structure is kind of like the Algorithmic Accountability Act where you're doing um, self-assess, the companies are doing, the platforms in this case are doing self-assessments, risk assessments, um, assessments of their risk mitigation strategies. And then these audits are reported to the EU, which then does, which then looks at them. Um, what's your opinion about this? Uh, and would this even be possible, this EU audit, without knowing what kind of data the platforms themselves have? I'll just say for myself, um, I think it's, you know, very sort of partial and baby steps, maybe a necessary first baby step. But, um, you know, what's missing from this, first of all, is any kind of standards by which the companies are going to audit themselves also kind of standardized reporting so that they are, um, uh, you know, comparable and, and can be easily kind of digested by outsiders. Um, it, it reminds me, it's a little bit like a transparency report plus. And so Mona, the point about like, where does transparency end, transparency reporting and auditing, accountability, auditing begin? Um, the platforms all have a lot of transparency reporting, but I'm sure we've all been among critics to, to um, poke holes in them and say, well, why aren't you telling us this, that, or the other thing? I think this is a little bit susceptible to the same kinds of problems, but I, Deb, what do you think? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about the DSA. <laughs> and, um, I, think, uh, I, I think a lot of what your comments were were in reference to Article 28, which is sort of the, the sort of internal audit requirement. And I think, um, uh, yeah, it, for me, it, it really is like the analogy to the transporting, the, the, trans, uh, the transparency reporting conversation happening in the States right now of 
um, you know, these companies need to just reveal information about how well their systems work. I think um, I, I'm always very skeptical around just how far you can go with, um, it, you know, uh, uh, depending on internal accounts of, you know, performance or, or risk. Um, I do think, uh, well, I, I think on one hand, uh, providing strict guidance in terms of the format and the requirements of such internal audit, like report outcomes, um, makes a lot of sense in terms of forcing these companies to reveal certain types of information. But there's already kind of been precedent, especially with Facebook, of them really just miscommunicating or intentionally obscuring some of the details of their system through kind of identifying loopholes in, in uh, you know, what they can or can't say, and thus kind of reporting kind of incomplete accounts of, of the level of risk of their system. So I found that that that's um, and you kind of rightfully pointed out, like if there's stricter guidelines around what they should be saying, if there's some level of oversight, then that might become easier. But I think that's the big risk of just purely depending on internal accounts is that um, these companies are not always fully honest or complete in their um, in their uh, in their reporting of what's going on on the inside of their systems. Um, I think there's a, there's an Article 31, which I'm sure uh, you know whoever posted this probably is aware of the level of debate around it, where it's talking about uh, providing external auditors with access to the systems to kind of come up with independent accounts of how well that system is working. You know, for obvious reasons, it seems like a great idea of like, yes, like we can, we don't have to depend on the internal accounts. We can also bring in external accounts for certain cases or allow researchers to come in and engage. I think there's already been, um, you know, there's a, 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 a bit of an open letter from uh, different groups such as Algorithm Watch um, and um, I think Human Rights Watch as well. There's been a couple of groups, uh, Access Now might have also commented on this, of how restrictive the current qualification section of that um, article is, where it's just restricted to academic researchers, whereas you have a lot of civil society groups, you have a lot of law firms, you have a lot of um, just other entities that participate in the external audit process. Um, uh, so they found that that article was restrictive, although the idea of access to an external party as part of like an independent oversight mechanism, I think is something that a lot of external auditors found to be an exciting prospect um, and a good counterbalance in addition to this sort of internal reporting out, um, um, uh, you know, uh, a caveat in the DSA. So I think that that's, that's a lot of my opinion about the DSA is that it, I think it was, it was one of the first instances I saw of third party audit external auditors being given like you know in, in this case specifically academic researchers being given an uh, an an avenue to access <laughs> the system which is really one of the biggest roadblocks for external auditing um but i think there's definitely a lot more that could be discussed with respect to the details of what those qualifications were for those external auditors um and and expanding that definition of participants to really encompass those um working on this um, I think the other thing as well is um, uh, with the internal accountability uh, clauses, uh, you know, closing some loopholes that companies have already proven that they would uh, take advantage of. So in the DSA, there's some loopholes around not reporting things that might compromise, you know, um, proprietary knowledge or, um, uh, you know, trade secrets. And that's definitely a loophole that companies are going to take. <laughs> um, uh, so I think that that's, de there's definitely a, been a lot of discourse on that end as well of uh, with internal audits and, and depending or relying on reporting out, uh, you know, uh, these trans in terms of these transparency reports, uh, how can we make it so that those, there's integrity to those reports and we can actually depend on them. Uh, the final point I'm going to make about the DSA and sort of conversations I've had about that in general is there seems to be a lot of confidence in like regulatory capacity to one, assess these transparency reports and two, maybe even mediate um, uh, uh, or facilitate their own kind of external investigations into the performance of these systems. And I'm a little bit more skeptical <laughs> than the DSA uh, kind of working group about just the um, capacity that regulators have uh, to, to do some of that work themselves um, versus relying on a, maybe a broader ecosystem of, of audit, like third party external audit participants to engage in that practice. So Mona mentioned a couple times this idea of, well, if a company is submitting their, uh, you know, internal risk assessment to the regulator, why not make that public? Or why not make that accessible to a third party upon request, like a vetted third party upon request? 
those are ideas that I think are worth definitely thinking a little bit more about is why depend completely on the regulator to sort of vet the quality of these internal audits uh, when you could actually make those accessible. And that's sort of another way to increase third party participation. Thank you. Um, Deb, so we have four minutes and I know Anna has something to say. And then you know, I've been for coming to DSA. <laughs> um, if you're following the DSA, please look at the Digital Services Oversight and Safety Act. Um, please, 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 please. Uh, it is an attempt at a US approach to this problem and, and really strengthens a lot of the holes that Deborah just pointed out, mostly because the United States, just within our First Amendment context, this is going to have to be our approach, right? Like deep transparency with independent audits, the separation from government, which is, you know, it's just realistically the approach we're going to have to strive for. And even then it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a trip. Um, but, you know, so we definitely took the approach of, you know, the similar audit, you know, we looked at the language, we added some additional things and then mandating that all the large covered platforms and, you know, there's some back and forth on if you should go them further than that, get an independent audit um, FTC can do rulemaking on like what that looks like, and, you know, like what count, counts as independence. Um, and that with the other thing is that the FTC will be able to do rulemaking both on how those auditors should get secure access to the data so they can actually get raw data. So if they want to audit the algorithms that are used through all those processes, they'd be able to get the raw data they needed to do that, along with 40 pages where we spell out essentially what's in Article 31, uh, which is researcher and civil society access to data in a way that is secure, you know, limits uh, law enforcement access. I mean, there's so many issues that come up, uh, especially in a country that doesn't have a comprehensive privacy law. Um, but the idea is to have kind of these multiple types of checks on what the platforms are doing. So both this independent auditor that's looking over the risk assessment and then this you know, set of civil society and researchers. The other thing I'll mention is that the audits do go back to the FTC who then summarizes and makes a public version available. Um, and this approach is, it's, the trade secrets is one thing. I think that gets talked about a lot. Um, and the way DeSoto has written, it trusts the FTC who is also in charge of the markets and competition to actually determine where the trade secret is, not the companies. Mm -hmm. But also national security is the other thing too. So you have to remember, right, these platforms are used to weaponize disinfo, um, especially Russia and China and troll bots. And, right, it's, it's a legitimate national concern, con security concern. And so there are some things you wouldn't want to make public for that reason too. And we worked really closely with a lot of national security experts. And Adam Schiff is, is one of the co-leads on the bill um, to, to think about that as well, which I think gets lost. But please look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Congresswoman Trahan, this bill is, I think, the last word on, on this topic so far in the U.S. So we'll, we'll put a link to the bill um, when we send this out. Mona, do you want the last word? Oh, my God, the last word um, was, you know, devil's advocate. I'm going to ask the big so what question, which is if we, you know, kind of acknowledge that these kinds of systems have become social infrastructure, right? They, they kind of really profoundly affect how we organize and hold together society. What if we, you know, find that one system or a part of a system so profoundly, um, you know, infringes on, on civil rights um, and so on? What, what do we do? Are we going to, can we shut it down? And the way in which I, the why, why I'm asking is, is, you know, when we when we have a restaurant that doesn't comply with, you know, food safety standards, we can close the restaurant. Can we close, can we close down an AI system, an algorithmic system or a part of it? So I would really encourage policymakers, industry, you know, my community, researchers to think about what's, you know, once we've got the audit figured out, what's what's on the other side, right? What how can we actually that act upon that gets us into the spokes of substantive of substantive law for each of these areas. Yes. Like, yeah. Can I just really, really quick, I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know if this community has seen the bipartisan staff draft privacy bill that's been circulating. Um, it includes, it would mandate algorithmic audits. Uh, and it also, to Mona's most recent point, would mandate uh, you know, that you follow discrimination law in data processing. It's bold, look at it for sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's bipartisan and somewhat bicameral. Uh, so definitely worth taking seriously now. Also, thanks. <laughs> All right, we have lots of things to look at, um, lots of big questions to ponder. Um, and I wanna thank all of you so much for joining us. Um, there were some technical problems I understand with this Zoom. So we're gonna send out, in any case we would, um, the uh, recording to all of the registrants. Um, take care everybody, have a good afternoon.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.